You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. So let's talk about the goddamn 80s, blue gal. All right, the 1980s? 1980s. Not the, the 1980s, the 1980s. The 1980s, the, the, the great American decade, the one that turned everything around. When everything Big changed. 80s, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, the 80s because a major event in both of our lives and the American political life of this country happened during the 1980s. But let me tell you what I was doing because that's it's all about me. Uh-huh. Um, in Illinois, where I live, the drinking age in 1979 was 19 years old. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. I was 19 years old in 1979. Also pretty cool. In um, October. You turned 19 in, I turned at the end 19, of October, at the right? end of October. And that's around the time Illinois decided to raise the age uh, to 21, starting in January 1st, 1980. Oh, my goodness. So, so you had I three had months. Two months. Two months, November, oh December, goodness. that's it. And uh, November, December, so I was highly focused on partying as hard as I could. Uh, <laughs> my mom was spending time with her boyfriend in Chicago much of the time. So we had the house to ourselves, my brother and I, and we raised all kinds of hell. My focuses at the time were uh, school was over for all intents and purposes as far as I was concerned. College, I didn't give a damn about. I had a job at Sears doing whatever. I was focused on uh, pot and beer, and uh, partying with my pals and my girlfriend. That was it. That was my that was my focus. Now, what were you doing in the 80s, Blue Gal? In 1980? Yeah. Uh, well, in 1980, in the spring of 1980, I was a volunteer for Ted Kennedy for president <laughs> at the age of 18. Nerd! I am shocked. One of us has evolved slightly since then. One of us has always <laughs> been awesome. And I'll leave it to the... <laughs> Listener decide which is which. Um, are, are there any records of your nerddom out there? In the yeah, universe? there's a picture of me shaking Ted Kennedy's hand in really? April of 1980 somewhere. I don't know where it is. Okay. I, it might be in one of the copious scrapbooks I kept as in high school. Mm-hmm. But I'd have to go down in the basement and look. I I will do that. But well, damn. yeah, well, I I went to the the rally and uh, met him. Got to sit up front because I was a volunteer and uh, got to shake his hand. And my picture was in the paper. Hot damn! So very exciting. Now I have gone to great lengths to make sure there's no photographic or audio recordings of any of my doings that period. So <laughs> I, I've been pretty thorough about that. There's no Ren Fair pictures of me or anything no, like that. No, those are all, all gone. Your armor, um, yeah. But that does bring us to the subject of t- today's podcast, which was the 1980 Democratic Convention. And at that convention, uh, Jimmy Carter was playing a real bad hand going into the 1980 election. The hostages in Iran were stuck there, and now we know that was thanks to Texas Republican Reagan supporting traitors to America. That's right. That has come out this year. Yep. Yeah, well confirmed, but yeah. You know, at the end of Jimmy Carter's life, they confess that, yeah. yes, we negotiated with the Iranians to keep them hostage for three extra months at least. Yeah, yeah. So and that Jimmy Carter would lose the general election. Yeah. And if, if you weren't around then, there was a guy named Ted Coppell, Ted Koppel, uh, yeah. who had an, a, a very TV friendly hair helmet, who had ran a program called Nightline. And Nightline was all about America held hostage day 17, America held hostage day 187. Day, and it was every fucking night we were reminded of how many hundreds of days these hostages had were being held. Yeah. This is before cable really blew up at right. all. Right. This was 11 at night. 11 at night on a network television Mm -hmm. every night, even when there's no news at all, when there's no development at all. He just was on there to remind us that America is being held hostage. And the subtext was always, 
And Jimmy Carter isn't doing a goddamn thing he's about failing. it. He's failing. Yeah. He's failing. Yeah. He's a failed, failed president. He failed Carter presidency. And I remember sitting in a bar, having a beer, watching what probably was Saturday Night Live. And I believe it was George Carlin who was, who was saying to the audience about this very thing, um, you know, what are we going to do about it? And, and the, the response was supposed to be, be very patient. And how Yay. long are we going to be patient? <laughs> as long as it takes. And he Yay. was really trying to get the audience into, which was a mature adult thing to do, which was kind of a weird thing for Saturday Night Live, which was neither mature nor adult. But it wasn't the rallying cry of a mighty nation. Mm -hmm. It was this kind of, yeah, we'll get to it eventually. But meanwhile, and we're doing the, the adult thing would be to be patient and to work it diplomatically and do all the things Carter was trying to do. But that's not what people wanted to hear. They wanted to hear, we're going to go over, we're going to kick some ass, and we're going to solve this problem. And Carter just wasn't going to do that. And mm -hmm. then came the economy. Yeah. It was the economy that was destroying Carter and his chances for re-election. As Douglas Hibbs wrote in American Politics Quarterly in 1982, having inherited a 7.7% rate of unemployment from the Ford administration, a hangover from the terrible 74-75 recession, the Carter administration pursued stimulative macroeconomic policies throughout 77 and into 78. The policies succeeded and helped lower unemployment by almost two percentage points between the end of 1976 and the beginning of 1979. However, inflation accelerated steadily in 77 and 78 and ratcheted upward even more in 1979 following the second big round of OPEC petroleum price increases. There was a real oil shock again. Yep. This prompted the Carter administration in late 1978 to abandon the liberal democratic goal of moving the economy toward full employment and to implement restrictive monetary and fiscal policies designed to put downward pressure on the inflation rate. The policy shift created an election year recession. Uh -huh. But because of the sluggish response of wages and prices to economic slack, the inflation rate declined only slightly during the last two quarters of 1980 from its mid-year peak. Consequently, President Carter and the Democrats went before the electorate in 1980 with the worst of all possible situations. High inflation, increased unemployment, and falling real income and output. And that was the first time since the Depression that that had happened, that real yeah. income had dropped. And everybody could see it. Yeah. Everybody felt it. And the, here was the bottom line. Carter's Fed chair, Paul Volcker, increased interest rates above 17% in an election year, if you can believe it. I, <laughs> yes. You know, it, it sounds like science fiction now, but this really happened. Yeah. The official end of the recession was established as July of 1980. As interest rates dropped beginning in May, payrolls turned positive, which is a good thing. Unemployment among auto workers rose from a low of 4.8% in 1979 to a record high of 24.7% and then fell to only 17.4% by the end of the year. No one was going to take out a car loan for 48 months at 14.32% interest. The American Politics Quarterly summed up the bad news for Carter this way. Quote, Carter had the worst election year economic record since Herbert Hoover. In 1980, for example, for the first time since 1932, the year-on-year -year growth rate of real output and income was actually negative. This is one important reason why President Carter's Gallup poll approval ratings plummeted in July of 1980 and trough of the 1980s recession to 21%, the lowest level recorded since the Gallup organization began polling in the 1930s during the Roosevelt administration. Now, when you've got a sitting president that whose approval rating is 21%, and not going anywhere. There's and nothing not going that's better anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in November of 1979, Jimmy Carter, the incumbent Democratic president, would get a primary challenger, Ted Kennedy. Mm -hmm. The New York Times reported, quote, the 47-year-old Massachusetts Democrat charged that President Carter had taken the single most inflationary step by lifting price controls from domestic crude oil last spring. 
and he attacked the president for saying that the American people were suffering a crisis of spirit. I say it is not the American people who are in a malaise, he told a crowd of several hundred supporters in nearby Manchester, New Hampshire. It's the political leadership that's in a malaise. And here is the deal with Carter and Kennedy. They really didn't like each other. Nope. Jimmy Carter, who was and is a Baptist, kept the White House alcohol-free while he was in office. Uh, the Kennedys, they did not do that. <laughs> no. And Joe Kennedy, the patriarch, was a bootlegger for yes, God. He so. yes, he was. Yes, he was. Jimmy Carter also saw America's problems through a Sunday school teacher's lens, as he was a Sunday school teacher. He did give Oval Office speeches about a mental and spiritual malaise in the nation and tried to sell conservation of energy as needing a, quote, moral equivalent of war, unquote, mentality. Critics turned that phrase into an acronym, meow. Yeah, yeah that's just shitty staff work. You know, you didn't think that through, did you? Yep. Yeah. His poor staff work, yes. On the other hand, Kennedy wanted a stimulus bill and wage price controls. You know, socialism. Socialism? And whether Ted Kennedy genuinely thought he could unseat Carter or that Carter was going to lose no matter what, and this was his time to burn off all the Chappaquiddick stink before a 1984 run. Remember, Ted Kennedy was only 47 in 1980. He took on his party in what I think was a sincere attempt to save his party. Carter was not a liberal Democrat, and Ted Kennedy thought that meant he wasn't a Democrat at all. It was time for someone, him, to run as a goddamn Democrat. As a goddamn Democrat. Now, Carter's incumbency meant that Ted Kennedy would have an uphill battle all the way during the primaries. In the end, Carter won 36 primaries to Ted Kennedy's 12. But it was Super Tuesday in June that showed Democrats were finally tired of rallying around the flag as Carter failed to bring the hostages home. Ted Kennedy won five primaries that day. That is huge, including California, while Carter won only three. The pressure to open up the Democratic convention and allow delegates to switch their votes was on. This led directly to the nastiest Democratic National Convention in modern history. That convention opened on Monday, August 11th, 1980 in New York City. The second day of the convention, Ted Kennedy conceded the nomination to Jimmy Carter. He did it in a speech that historians of political conventions will never forget. The speech is in all the greatest speeches of the 20th century books. It's in Ted Kennedy's obituary. When TV stations covered his death from brain cancer 29 years later, they used clips from this speech to honor his life. Now, we're going to play the speech in its entirety for this podcast, because what he says about who the Democratic Party was in 1980 is much of what needs to be said about the Democratic Party in 2023. Listen for three things Kennedy did in this speech. He conceded to Carter... He smacked down Reagan and the Republicans, and most importantly, he reminded Democrats who they are and what they must stand for. Thank you very much, Barbara Mikulski, for your very eloquent your eloquent introduction distinguished legislator great spokeswoman for economic democracy and social justice in this country I thank you for your eloquent introduction well things worked out a little different from the way I thought but let me tell you I still love New York. <laughs> my fellow Democrats and my fellow Americans, I have come here tonight not to argue as a candidate, but to affirm a cause. I'm asking you, 
I am asking you to renew the commitment of the Democratic Party to economic justice. I am asking you to renew our commitment to a fair and lasting prosperity that can put America back to work. This is the cause that brought me into the campaign and that sustained me for nine months across a hundred thousand miles in 40 different states. We had our losses, but the pain of our defeats is far, far less than the pain of the people that I have met. We have learned that it is important to take issues seriously, but never to take ourselves too seriously. The serious issue before us tonight is the cause for which the Democratic Party has stood in its finest hours, the cause that keeps our party young and makes it, in the second century of its age, the largest political party in this republic and the longest lasting political party on this planet. Our cause has been, since the days of Thomas Jefferson, the cause of the common man and the common woman. Our commitment has been, since the days of Andrew Jackson, to all those he called the humble members of society the farmers, mechanics, and laborers. On this foundation, we have defined our values, refined our policies, and refreshed our faith. Now I take the unusual step of carrying the cause and the commitment of my campaign personally to our national convention. I speak out of a deep sense of urgency about the anguish and anxiety I have seen across America. I speak out of a deep belief in the ideals of the Democratic Party and in the potential of that party and of a president to make a difference. And I speak out of a deep trust in our capacity to proceed with boldness and a common vision that will feel and heal the suffering of our time, and the divisions of our party. The economic plank of this platform on its face concerns only material things. But it is also a moral issue that I raise tonight. It has taken many forms over many years in this campaign and in this country that we seek to lead, the challenge in 1980 is to give our voice and our vote for these fundamental democratic principles. Let us pledge that we will never misuse unemployment, high interest rates, and human misery as false weapons against inflation. Let us pledge that employment will be the first priority of our economic policy. Let us pledge that there will be security for all those who are now at work, and let us pledge that there will be jobs for all who are out of work, and we will not compromise on the issues of jobs.
These are not simplistic pledges. Simply put, they are the heart of our tradition, and they have been the soul of our party across the generations. It is the glory and the greatness of our tradition to speak for those who have no voice, to remember those who are forgotten, to respond to the frustrations and fulfill the aspirations of all Americans seeking a better life in a better land. We dare not forsake that tradition. We cannot let the great purposes of the Democratic Party become the bygone passages of history. We must not permit the Republicans to seize and run on the slogans of prosperity. We heard the orators at their convention all trying to talk like Democrats. They proved that even Republican nominees can quote Franklin Roosevelt to their own purpose. The grand old party thinks it has found a great new trick. But 40 years ago, an earlier generation of Republicans attempted the same trick. And Franklin Roosevelt himself replied, most Republican leaders have bitterly fought and blocked the forward surge of average men and women in their pursuit of happiness. Let us not be deluded that overnight those leaders have suddenly become the friends of average men and women. You know, he continued, very few of us are that gullible. And four years later, when the Republicans tried that trick again, Franklin Roosevelt asked, can the old guard pass itself off as the New Deal? I think not. We have all seen many marvelous stunts in the circus, but no performing elephant could turn a handspring without falling flat on its back. The 1980 Republican convention was a wash with crocodile tears for our economic distress, but it is by their long record and not their recent words that you shall know them. The same Republicans who are talking about the crisis of unemployment have nominated a man who once said, and I quote, unemployment insurance is a prepaid vacation plan for freeloaders and that nominee is no friend of labor. The same Republicans who are talking about the problems of the inner cities have nominated a man who said, and I quote, I have included in my morning and evening prayers every day the prayer that the federal government not bail out New York, and that nominee is no friend of this city and our great urban centers across this nation. The same Republicans who are talking about security for the elderly have nominated a man who said just four years ago that participation in Social Security should be made voluntary and that nominee is no friend of the senior citizens of this nation. The same Republicans who are talking about preserving the environment 
have nominated a man who last year made the preposterous statement, and I quote, 80% of our air pollution comes from plants and trees. And that nominee is no friend of the environment. And the same Republicans who are invoking Franklin Roosevelt have nominated a man who said in 1976, and these are his exact words, fascism was really the basis of the New Deal. And that nominee, whose name is Ronald Reagan, has no right to quote Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> the great adventures which our opponents offer is a voyage into the past. Progress is our heritage, not theirs. What is right for us as Democrats is also the right way for Democrats to win. The commitment I seek is not to outworn views, but to old values that will never wear out. Programs may sometimes become obsolete, but the ideal of fairness always endures. Circumstances may change, but the work of compassion must continue. It is surely correct that we cannot solve problems by throwing money at them. But it is also correct that we dare not throw out our national problems onto a scrap heap of inattention and indifference. The poor may be out of political fashion, but they are not without human needs. The middle class may be angry, but they have not lost the dream that all Americans can advance together. The demand, the demand of our people in 1980 is not for smaller government or bigger government, but for better government. Some say that government is always bad and that spending for basic social programs is the root of our economic evils. But we reply, the present inflation and recession cost our economy $200 billion a year. We reply, inflation and unemployment are the biggest spenders of all. The task of leadership in 1980 is not to parade scapegoats or to seek refuge in reaction, but to match our power to the possibilities of progress. While others talked of free enterprise, it was the Democratic Party that acted and we ended excessive regulation in the airline and trucking industry. And we restored competition to the marketplace. And I take some satisfaction that this deregulation legislation that I sponsored and passed in the Congress of the United States. As Democrats, we recognize that each generation of Americans has a rendezvous with a different reality. The answers of one generation become the questions of the next generation. But there is a guiding star in the American firmament. It is as old as the revolutionary belief that all people are created equal, and as clear as the contemporary condition of Liberty City and the South Bronx. Again and again, Democratic leaders have followed that star, and they have given new meaning to the old values of liberty and justice for all. We are the party, we are the party of the new freedom, the new deal, and the new frontier. We have always been the party of hope, 
So this year, let us offer new hope. New hope to an America uncertain about the present, but unsurpassed in its potential for the future. To all those who are idle in the cities and industries of America, let us provide new hope for the dignity of useful work. Democrats have always believed that a basic civil right of all Americans is that their right to earn their own way. The party of the people must always be the party of full employment. <laughs> to all those who doubt the future of our economy, let us provide new hope for the reindustrialization of America and let our vision reach beyond the next election or the next year to a new generation of prosperity. If we could rebuild Germany and Japan after World War II, then surely we can reindustrialize our own nation and revive our inner cities in the 1980s. <laughs> to all those who work hard for a living wage, let us provide new hope that their price of their employment shall not be an unsafe workplace and a death at an earlier age. <laughs> to all those who inhabit our land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, let us provide new hope that prosperity shall not be purchased by poisoning the air, the rivers, and the natural resources that are the greatest gift of this continent. We must insist that our children and our grandchildren shall inherit a land which they can truly call America the Beautiful. To all those who see the worth of their work and their savings taken by inflation, let us offer new hope for a stable economy. We must meet the pressures of the present by invoking the full power of government to master increasing prices. In Canada, we must say that the federal budget can be balanced only by policies that bring us to a balanced prosperity of full employment and price restraint. to all those overburdened by an unfair tax structure, let us provide new hope for real tax reform. Instead of shutting down classrooms, let us shut off tax shelters. Instead of cutting out school lunches, let us cut off tax subsidies for expensive business lunches that are nothing more than food stamps for the rich. The tax cut of our Republican opponents takes the name of tax reform in vain. It is a wonderfully Republican idea that would redistribute income in the wrong direction. It's good news for any of you with incomes over $200,000 a year. For the few of you, it offers a pot of gold worth $14,000. But the Republican tax cut is bad news for the middle-income families. For the many of you, they plan a pittance of $200 a year. And that is not what the Democratic Party means when we say tax reform. The vast majority of Americans cannot afford this panacea from a Republican nominee who has denounced the progressive income tax as the invention of Karl Marx. I am afraid he has confused Karl Marx with Theodore Roosevelt.
obscure Republican president who sought and fought for a tax system based on ability to pay. Theodore Roosevelt was not Karl Marx and the Republican tax scheme is not tax reform. Finally, we cannot have a fair prosperity and isolation from a fair society. So I will continue to stand for a national health insurance. <laughs> we must, we must not surrender. We must not surrender to the relentless medical inflation that can bankrupt almost anyone and that may soon break the budgets of government at every level. Let us insist on real controls over what doctors and hospitals can charge and let us resolve that the state of a family's health shall never depend on the size of a family's wealth. The President, the Vice President, the members of Congress have a medical plan that meets their needs in full. And whenever senators and representatives catch a little cold, the Capitol physician will see them immediately, treat them promptly, fill a prescription on the spot. We do not get a bill even if we ask for it. And when do you think was the last time a member of Congress asked for a bill from the federal government? And I say again, as I have before, if health insurance is good enough for the President, the Vice President, the Congress of the United States, then it's good enough for you and every family in America. There were some, there were some who said we should be silent about our differences on issues during this convention. But the heritage of the Democratic Party has been a history of democracy. We fight hard because we care deeply about our principles and purposes. We did not flee this struggle. We welcome the contrast with the empty and expedient spectacle last month in Detroit, where no nomination was contested, no question was debated, and no one dared to raise any doubt or dissent. <laughs> Democrats can be proud that we chose a different course and a different platform. We can be proud that our party stands for inv investment in safe energy instead of a nuclear future that may threaten the future itself. We must not permit the neighborhoods of America to be permanently shadowed by the fear of another Three Mile Island. We can be proud that our party stands for a fair housing law to unlock the doors of discrimination once and for all. The American House will be divided against itself so long as there is prejudice against any American buying or renting a home. And we can be proud that our party stands plainly and publicly and persistently for the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. their rightful place at our convention, and women must have their rightful place in the Constitution of the United States. On this issue, 
We will not yield. We will not equivocate. We will not rationalize, explain, or excuse. We will stand for ERA and for the recognition at long last that our nation was made up of founding mothers as well as founding fathers. A fair prosperity and a just society are within our vision and our grasp, and we do not have every answer. There are questions not yet asked waiting for us in the recesses of the future. But of this much we can be certain, because it is the lesson of all of our history. Together, a president and the people can make a difference. I have found that faith still alive wherever I have traveled across this land. So let us reject the council of retreat and the call to reaction. Let us go forward in the knowledge that history only helps those who help themselves. There will be setbacks and sacrifices in the years ahead. But I am convinced that we as a people are ready to give something back to our country in return for all it has given to us. Let this, let this be our commitment. Whatever sacrifices must be made will be shared and shared fairly. And let this be our confidence. At the end of our journey and always before us shines that ideal of liberty and justice for all. In closing, let me say a few words to all those that I have met and to all those who have supported me at this convention and across the country. There were hard hours on our journey and often we sailed against the wind, but always we kept our rudder true and there were so many of you who stayed the course and shared our hope. You gave your help, but even more, you gave your hearts. And because of you, this has been a happy campaign. You welcomed Joan, me, and our family into your homes and neighborhoods, your churches, your campuses, your union halls. And when I think back of all the miles and all the months and all the memories, I think of you. And I recall the poet's words, and I say, what golden friends I had. Among you, my golden friends across this land, I have listened and learned. I have listened to Kenny Du Bois, a glass poer in Charleston, West Virginia, who has 10 children to support, but has lost his job after 35 years, just three years short of qualifying for his pension. I have listened to the Tractor family who farm in Iowa and who wonder whether they can pass the good life and the good earth on to their children. I have listened to the grandmother in East, Los and in East Oakland who no longer has a phone to call her grandchildren because she gave it up to pay the rent on her small apartment. I have listened to young workers out of work, to students without the tuition for college, and to families without the chance to own a home. I have seen the closed factories and the stalled assembly lines of Anderson, Indiana and Southgate, California and I have seen too many, far too many, idle men and women desperate to work. I have seen too many, far too many, working families desperate to protect the value of their wages from the ravages of inflation. Yet I have also sensed a yearning for new hope among the people in every state where I have been. And I have felt it in their handshakes, I saw it in their faces, and I shall never forget the mothers who carry children to our rallies. I shall always remember the elderly who have lived in an America of high purpose and who believe that it can all happen again. Tonight in their name, I have come here to speak for them and for their sake, I ask you to stand with them. On their behalf, I ask you to restate and reaffirm the timeless truth of our party. I congratulate President Carter on his victory here.
I am, I am confident that the Democratic Party will reunite on the basis of democratic principles and that together we will march towards a democratic victory in 1980. And someday, long after this convention, long after the signs come down and the crowds stop cheering and the bands stop playing, may it be said of our campaign that we kept the faith. May it be said of our party in 1980 that we found our faith again. And may it be said of us both in dark passages and in bright days, in the words of Tennyson that my brothers quoted and loved, and that have special meaning for me now. I am a part of all that I have met. Too much is taken, much abides. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. For me, a few hours ago, this campaign came to an end. For all those whose cares have been our concern, the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. And it would be forever known as the dream shall never die speech. Mm -hmm. I remember as an 18 year old watching the speech from my home in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania. I didn't cry and I didn't cry Mm -hmm. and I didn't cry. Then the phone rang. It was my dad who was in Chicago visiting his mother. Dad didn't even say hello. He just said, is there a dry eye in the house? (laughs) That's your dad. And I burst out crying. And the thing is, a whole lot of Democrats burst out crying. Not just because here was the only surviving brother of a great Democratic dynasty, but because he was standing for the values of the Democratic Party. Jobs, the working class, and equality that still mattered despite the passing of decades. Ted Kennedy gave a 32-minute speech interrupted with cheers and applause 51 times and followed with 30 minutes of cheers and applause and crying afterwards. And Jimmy Carter had to follow that. Yikes. So what happened after the speech at the convention? Well, that's the story, isn't it? Um, Ted Kennedy told his side of the story for an oral history project of the University of Virginia during the 2000s. Remember, Kennedy's speech was Tuesday night, the second night of the convention. And here's what Kennedy told the University of Virginia historians. Quote, they were there Wednesday, and they, the convention delegates, were doing the platform. I couldn't believe that we, the Carter people and the Kennedy people, were still battling and fighting over the platform. And someone said, well, they, Carter delegates, have the votes. But we could have minority reports. So the people were going to be able to still speak, meaning give speeches, about these things which drove the Carter people crazy too. We had all this tension going all the way through. And I had a very substantial group of supporters who said they would be very offended after all this battle on the platform if I even went on stage with Carter. They were a very substantial group. And then there was another group who said, you should. But I think it was very disputed. Very good people, too. The Carter people weren't really sure whether I was going to stay, but they didn't make any effort. I was there all day Wednesday and all day Thursday. As I mentioned, he could have said, well, you come on down. I'd love to see you and bring your family down. Rosalind would love to thank you. They were continuing to fight these platform things. We were still fighting with them on it. And then there was a question of whether we would go to the convention floor on Thursday after Carter's speech, but I had told them that we felt I would go. And that's when I told the Secret Service we leave the night afterwards. I had to go back, not go home, because that's when Secret Service leaves you. They leave you off at home that night, and boom, they're gone. Now, this is the difference between Secret Service protection for a president, 
Carter and a senator, Ted Kennedy. But this was a Kennedy at a convention. And somehow the Carter people didn't think about the fact that Bobby Kennedy had been assassinated at the California Democratic Convention 12 years earlier. Carter really did miss the forest for the trees a lot in his presidency. See Jimmy Carter personally micromanaging the White House (laughs) tennis court schedule. And this was one time that definitely happened. He just missed it and didn't talk to Ted Kennedy about what was going to happen. Right. So Kennedy continues. So boom, his speech ended. Down we went. We had a Secret Service escort down there to the convention. For 15 minutes, 17 minutes, it was silent in that place. The whole thing was all over. So there was no 30-minute ovation for the speech from the Democratic president of the United States. You mean he wasn't interrupted 51 times? No. No. (laughs) He was not. No. Kennedy continues. So... Instead of going to the holding room, all I heard was, come on up, you've got to run up. Everybody's worrying, wondering where the hell have you been? They were bitching because I was late. It's unbelievable because when I said I'd stay there, it was fine with me. I didn't care. No, no, you don't have to. And then, as you saw, when I went on the platform, they had a whole series of other people who went on. I shook his hand. I shook Rosalind's hand. And right behind me was Tip O'Neill. And right behind him was the party, Bob Strauss, and a whole series of party leaders all crowding in there. You look at the picture of that podium. There are 30 people there. It's not just me and him. And me over on the side, you could see all the other people who were going there. Mondale was on that. Joan Mondale was there. We had the one picture facing the crowd where Carter was on the one side And I think it's Bob Strauss and Mondale and then me. And then next to me, I think, is Mrs. Carter. I think she came over and pulled me on in. I must have shaken hands with him two or three times, but I didn't elevate his hand. He made no effort to elevate mine. I thought it was proper enough. But as the press pointed out, there wouldn't be any pictures of me raising his hand, which I had not expected to do. But if he had raised both of our hands... I would not have resisted it, certainly. Now, traditionally, it would be Carter raising hands with his running mate, Walter Mondale. Yeah, every convention. <laughs> that's how these things go. Every right? time. And then there's a bunch of other stuff, but that's the shot. Yeah. It wasn't Kennedy's place to raise hands with Jimmy Carter as if he was his running mate. Ted Kennedy expected stage management from the Carter camp. If the Kennedys knew anything as an Irish Catholic... Democratic Boston political dynasty, it was stage management. Hell yeah. You know, the whole Catholic Church is stage management. Camelot was stage management. The Carter camp apparently didn't know enough to do that or didn't care enough, or they just hated Ted Kennedy but needed him to do all the things. It wasn't going to happen because Carter wouldn't ask. But you know, Blue Gal, you know who did know about stage management? Who? The veteran Hollywood actor Ronald Wilson Reagan knew Uh all about stage management and ritual Uh and props and sets and where the cameras are and who should be on stage and who should be saying what and when. But we digress. Yeah, yeah. That's another tale for another day. Yeah. A year before he died, Ted Kennedy, the lion of the Senate, had one more Democratic convention to address. He left his sickbed in 2008 to say this. I have come here tonight to stand with you, to change America, to restore its future, to rise to our best ideals, and to elect Barack Obama President of the United States. Thanks for listening. We need your support to make this podcast fly. Please do not impose wage price controls on this podcast. Instead, donate to our show via Patreon at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for doing that. See you next time. We'll see you next time. The Professional Left Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions. DGBG Productions.